Okay, a lovely sunny day here. Um, so well, folks, I thought I'd um, share a little video which is um, might trigger an interest or even act as a distraction in these COVID times. Uh, indeed, as of tonight, I think midnight, um, we're in the border area here, Cavan. Um, we'll be entering level four lockdown. Uh, like you aren't suffering enough COVID fatigue. But sure, here we are. We have to just get through it. Um, although I have to admit, we're lucky enough here in this small village of Butler's Bridge. This is um, a small village outside Cavan Town. And uh, anybody here in Butler's Bridge, sure, um, you know, if you take a few steps outside your house, you're in the countryside and uh, if you head out for a walk anywhere um, you can be easily distracted by the nature around you anyway so you know if you need to get out and about and clear your head um, once you start looking at the nature around you sure it acts as a distraction um, which is great for the mind and sure even if you just look outside your door amongst the cracks in the pavement even you might even come across a wild edible called hairy bittercress. Now, I didn't even know about this plant up till a few days ago, so I'm learning something new all the time. Like, uh, like last year, before this, I would not have been aware of, as I said, the hairy bittercress. There'd be um, wood and common sorrel, burdock root, pig nuts, I've had a few pig nuts, a few mushrooms like the prince mushroom, parasol, amber jelly roll, and a few more that just don't come to mind at the moment. And we'll be covering a few plants later on in the video. Stay tuned for that. Um, so I suppose one of the things with um, wild edibles is like, how can you be sure about what you're eating? Um, because there are some very dangerous, lethal plants out there and um, you need to do your research. Um, it's always good to have a reference booklet with you. Uh, there are plenty of resources also on the internet. And in the past, where an expert would bring a group out, you know, and at least when you have someone there with you and you can feel the plant, feel the texture of the leaf, look out for the key identifiers, you can um, smell the, the, the undergrowth, the, the surrounding habitat. All these kind of tie into understanding and knowing a, a plant. And unfortunately, because of this pandemic at the moment, you can kind of scrap that idea because you're not going to find uh, these organized field trips. Uh, so the next best thing is to make contact online, maybe with an expert. And this is what we've done here. Like in the next part of this video, uh, it's a Zoom one-to-one -one talk with um, Mark Williams. The video, uh, now I will admit the video and the audio quality, and it's purely on my end, uh, might not be great, but it still gives you an idea if you're uh, somebody that was interested in doing one of these one-to-one -one, uh, talks with Mark, um, at least you know in advance what you're in for. Uh, so it's a Zoom one-to-one. -one. Um, Mark is, uh, you know, he, he's, he, this is what, what he does, this is his profession. And apart from identifying plants, um, like he, he's full of ideas, recipes, preserving, you know, there's any amount of knowledge there. So let's jump straight in uh, and Mark will introduce himself. Uh, you don't have to go to the whole end of the video. I mean, if you're interested, go through the video and you might pick up something. But it's really just to give you an idea how the one to one zoom thing uh, starts off. And maybe it's something you'd be interested in. I leave links in the description for Mark's website. Um, again, there's lots of knowledge on the website. There's lots of information and recipes and et cetera on the website. So definitely check it out. Yeah, so um, I'm Mark Williams from uh, Galloway uh, Wild Foods. I uh, teach about foraging uh, full-time um, and uh, I do that through Galloway Wild Foods, which is my website. Uh, I'm based in Southwest Scotland and uh, on my web website is uh, lots of free information about how to uh, 
find and use and safely identify and uh, conserve um, plants, fungi and seaweeds. And uh, during, during lockdown uh, for COVID, I um, explored ways to kind of connect with people online. And one of the things I came up with is this sort of one-to-one uh, -one mentoring service. So people kind of book an appointment with me and uh, we just chat about their particular needs and the things that they're exploring um, in terms of plants and wild food and things like that. A lot of that is uh, helped with identification, but it, I do, I'm mentoring everybody from other foraging teachers to people who are complete novices and everywhere kind of in between that. And uh, uh, Padraig uh, kind of got in touch with me and uh, to, he's been exploring his local woodland and he was keen to record this um, for uh, use in the local community and maybe help people connect a bit more deeply with plants. So it's uh, nice, nice if we can use it a little bit more widely. So I hope it's helpful. Yeah, sure. The terrain would be probably exactly or very close to what you have over there. So we, we'd have all the plants here. Would be, it would be common to what you see. And yes, so. yes. Yeah. There are some challenges around um, around ph photography of plants and uh, what works best in taking good pictures. But I have had sessions with you before, Patrick, haven't we? And we've kind of uh, we've, we've worked out that video doesn't work particularly well, especially live video. Yeah. And um, yeah. we'll see how we go today with the photos and see what's possible. Definitely right. learn go along what, what works and what doesn't. <clears throat> now, I think, you are you seeing anything? I am, I'm seeing your uh, files there, yeah. Excellent, okay, let's see. Well, okay, well, I suppose there's, there's two, um, two plants that I'm interested in and I know for foragers, they're supposed, you know, like to be very common, and maybe they're easy for for beginners to, to look into. But I went searching for chickweed yesterday, or the day before, and I didn't have a whole pile of success looking for it. Um, and again, maybe it's the time of year, maybe it's um, it's hard to find it amongst the grass and so on, because I suppose the flowering part of it, the key identifier on it, probably is not available to us. Maybe this time of year, I'm guessing. But yeah, um, um, uh, um, chickweed's a funny one because uh, gardeners probably uh, see it all the time and, and uh, are all too worried about it and generally trying to get rid of it. Whereas foragers um, have to go looking for it. <laughs> and in the wild, it's one of these plants that very much likes uh, gardeners to do all that hard work and disturb the soil for it and then it, uh, and then it kind of piles on in. But um, actually, yeah, in the wild, you have to sort of search around for it. And I suppose it's partly because it's um, quite a small so fairly frail, uh, straggly plant that can kind of disappear in amongst uh, other foliage quite easily. So uh, yeah, it's quite quite an interesting little juxtaposition, isn't it? I think the only place I found it was in a polytunnel. So I'm not too sure. I've clicked on one of those um, pictures. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So, am I right in thinking, uh, I know my photos aren't the best, but are, am I right in thinking I have found chickweed there? I, I think you have, yes. Um, it's a small straggly plant. Uh, with these kind of oval leaves with the point at the end um, and it, it's, it's straggly and thin quite often unless it's doing really well when you can get kind of really nice dense thickets of it so if you zoom back out a little bit uh, yeah that would be great okay. and, uh, yeah and uh, as I say habitat's kind of a, a really helpful thing in identifying chickweed because it does like that sort of disturbed soil and areas where there is um, just a slight competitive advantage for these small, quick growing annual plants. Um, the, the kind of places I tend to find it apart, out with gardens, I mean, it is a, you know, really, really most common of all in, in gardens where people are trying to grow vegetables and clearing the land and things like that. But um, <clears throat> where I find it most commonly in the wild is um, under trees where there's a lot of grazing animals nearby and they might be kind of dropping, uh, you know, like where they're composting the ground, shall we say, to put it in the polite uh, parlance. Oh, okay. but yeah, this looks very much like chickweed. One of the key identifiers for chickweed, because there are other straggly little green plants that can look similar. One of the key identifiers for it, and you do need good eyes for this. I'm not. It's not super obvious from these photos. Is when you look at the the stem, um, it has these oppositely paired leaves. But if you look really closely at the stem, it has a line of hairs that run down. You could just about see it on that out of focus one there. Um, it has a line of. Oh, you can see it there, maybe has a, a single line of hairs that run down one side of the stem, okay? And mm -hmm. at, at every leaf junction, that, that line of hairs moves around to a, to a different size uh, side of the stem. So um, you need to kind of, I need to put my glasses on my nose to see that when I've got it in my hand, but it's, yeah. um, it's fairly, fairly distinctive if you can see it, if, if that makes any sense. 
But at the same time, it's, is it unlikely you're going to pick something dangerous as a lookalike or there's not? Um, I think um, if you did make a mistake with chickweed, it's, it's lower risk than if you made a mistake identifying, for example, something along the lines of uh, cow parsley or, you know, one of those things in the, in the, in the carrot family of plants. Yeah. Uh, there are things that I have, I mean, I've, I've made this mistake myself and I've been picking chickweed for quite a few years now. And uh, there, there are little kind of especially aquatic species that can look a little bit similar. And then um, what I do, I just kind of crush it and make sure there's no, no strong smell. So the whole thing with chickweed is it's kind of mild taste, mild smelling, mild tasting. Got right. this kind of light, grassy, kind of salady kind of vibe to it, a bit like pea skins, but even lighter than that. And um, and if there's any kind of strong pungent flavor or anything, that should uh, set the alarm bells ringing. Okay. Um, and then a little tiny taste. Um, you know, normally you should try and identify something before tasting, but that's the the final kind of bridge into into full identification. It's just having a little taste of the chickweed. So and, uh, it should just be mild and grassy. If you get kind of bitterness or um, stringency or hotness or anything like that you've you've got the wrong thing and you need to go back and uh, and start your identification again okay so basically those two end photos there were in a polytunnel and then, then went hunting just on a bit of grassland uh and i thought this might be chickweed but i'm thinking it is not now at this stage and it, it, it's possibly you know this is where i would have made the mistake possibly does that it probably is not chickweed that i'm guessing yeah, um, it looks slightly hairy and a little bit glossy, that one. Uh, it's pretty pretty tough to say from this photograph yeah. uh, whether it is or isn't, but, um, yeah, you would kind of have to hesitate on that one. I mean, yeah. a good thing to do with chickweed is to uh, look for the flowers. It should have these, um, I think they're seven-pointed. I need to check on that. Um, Star-shaped, tiny white flowers, and they're, they're quite tiny. You know, chickweed can grow to, I don't know, 50 centimetres, maybe, maybe more uh, tall, you know, in long grass, and it kind of climbs up. Those can but, Wow, the flowers are always quite tiny. Um, its uh, Latin name is Stellaria, which uh, refers to the sort of star-like little white flowers. So little tiny multi-pointed white flowers that you're looking for. And if you don't see them, then, you know, it may be that it's just not flowering at that stage, but it's an annual, so it has several cycles. Um, um, you know, it, it, it could, could be in flower at any point between uh, spring and autumn. Oh, okay. I tend, I tend to still find good chickweed I, I don't know if it's because I'm looking in different places at that time of year or looking in different ways, but I tend to find good lost chickweed round about this time of year still. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, again, normally in kind of uh, animal fields where there's kind of long, kind of fairly lush grass, quite often under the trees where there's a slight competitive advantage against the grass because it's a bit shaded and the chickweed kind of springs up there. I also think it's because the animals maybe kind of shelter in there. And right. their tongue is enriching the ground a little bit more and disturbing the ground probably as well. A bit like gardeners do, you know, with their hooves. So it's making opportunities for, for the chickweed. chickweed. I'm presuming or this time of year, I know you said if the flowers in different cycles, but I presume from here on there'd be less likelihood of finding flowers on chickweed. and, and... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it still could. I, I, it seems to me that I, um, I'm not, as I, I should say, I'm not, I'm not, not a botanist and I don't, haven't closely studied chickweed, but it seems to me that it, it has a pretty long kind of flowering cycle and at any kind of point during its kind of growth period, you may find some flowers on it or, or on a plant nearby, you know, they're not all fully synchronized like, like some of the bigger, slower growing plants, you know, they all, they all come into flower at exactly the same time. It seems to be a bit of staggering on that with chickweed. And I, I've certainly seen flowers on chickweed at this time of year and uh, it, it certainly helps to identify them. There is a page for chickweed on my website on Galloway Wild Foods, just use the search box and go to chickweed I and I've got some photos of it there and a little bit more information on, on it there as well. Great. Can we the next one again? I'm sure it's probably not. I just think one, one last thing about chickweed. Um, and if people are watching this, um, other than other than yourself, Hudrick, um, it's really well worth trying chickweed. It's delicious. Uh, it's really light and grassy. I see it as like one of the really nice salad plants of the wild food world. And, and, and in, a, in a world of wild food, uh, there's a lot of really strong pungent flavors, which are amazing, but they're quite often too much. Um, and the chickweed is actually mild and kind of grassy, but not in a bad way, <laughs> kind of light flavor, like, uh, as I say, a bit like mange two peas. 
and it's an absolute delight. And I know a lot of really good chefs who get really excited about putting chickweed on their uh, on their menus and things like that. Um, you can kind of use it as a vegetable as well and chop it and put it in pakora mixes and add it through stir fries, use it a bit like spinach. But I think it's actually at its best just, just in a salad kind of kind of roll. Yeah. Come here, the next group of photos there, uh, again, I, I don't, uh, even if we don't identify them, I was just, I was curious on my, on my travels. So, oh yeah, here we go. Um, so this would, would have been close to being under a very large birch tree and there's some berries on it, but uh, I'll just show you the leaves first, back and front. I, okay, yeah, I think I've got an idea of this. Have you got another picture of that? I, I think do. this is in uh, the St. John's Wort family of plants and I suspect from the habitat you've told me, yes, yes. So this is uh, called Tutsan, T-U-T-S-A-N, and it's a ground cover, sort of small shrub, I suppose you would call it, that's really uh, quite common on the woodland. And we've got areas in Galloway in southwest Scotland here where this is the predominant understory plant for quite large areas of deciduous woodland. Uh, that's not to say, I think, it, I don't think it's a non-native invasive problematic species at all, but it can kind of take over a little bit uh, where it gets established. I suppose all plants are trying to take over, but it's in the Hypericum family. So it's the same family as uh, St. John's wort, which is widely used as an, uh, as a, as a, to make a tea and uh, as, a, an, as an antidepressant. But uh, I don't think Tutson shares those properties. I, I don't consider, now there's a, there's a use for most plants and I, I don't always know all of them uh, off the top of my head, but uh, I don't, I'm not aware of toxin being used, and I believe that it has mild, it can be mildly toxic. Oh. The berries that you see, though they look juicy and appetizing, if you crushed any of them, you probably would have found that they were just really crumbly and they're not juicy like they look. They're just basically full of seed and uh, they would be quite astringent on the mouth and uh, certainly not food. So oh. I would say this one's off the menu, Padraig. Again, just a curiosity. So, um... you know, nice, nice to know what's around you. I mean, I think foraging is not only about going and finding food. It's about connecting and about learning about nature and uh, seeing how we fit into that world. And, um, you know, just to, if it makes you more interested in what's around you, then that's just, that's all, all, all better, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this is again, is a small plant underneath um, maybe a, a young uh, oak. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know this one. Uh, just show me another picture, just, just so I could be sure. Um, I suppose I'm going, like it, it is actually a blanket of, of this really under yes, the trees. Yes. And I'm going to presume it's really quite wet ground as well. Yes, so yes. this is a little, uh, very common little woodland plant that only grows in wet shady ground on the trees, but it is pretty common. And um, this is called um, opposite leaved golden saxifrage. Oh, okay. um, quite a long, quite a long name. Saxifrage would be the name. Uh, to go by, but there are a few types of saxifrage out there. So yeah, this one I, I think is going to be opposite leaf golden saxifrage. And what's going to happen with this in the in the end by the end of about February, um, it, this will open, and it's one of the first things to flower on the woodland floor, just about when the wild garlic's starting. So by March and then April, it's um, this is going to have beautiful little yellow inflorescences, but they don't really look like flowers in the traditional sense. They look more like um, like more like really yellow leaves, but it can look extremely beautiful when there's lots of it. Yeah, so you can see the leaves there are oppositely paired. So this is um, opposite leaf. There is another version called alternate leaved uh, saxifrage, uh, but I think what you've got there is opposite leaf golden saxifrage. Not edible, I presume. Uh, actually, you can eat this, and uh, I don't I don't personally rate it very highly, but it's so common you can nibble on it. I I, I think it I find it a little bit astringent, okay. but uh, it's certainly nothing harmful in it. And um, I know people who add it in salads, and when it's flowering, it looks extremely pretty as <coughs> well. So like, very nice in like little garnishes on a bit of sushi or or oh. things. But um, it's too small and fiddly to really eat in any particularly large quantities, but. Uh, it'd be quite nutritious, I'm sure. I, I don't know any uh, the details of it, but I, I would imagine it's, um, you know, eating lots and lots of small things is a really good way to, you know, increasing the biodiversity of your diet is a really nice way to go. And a little bit of that mixed in with your, for example, chickweed uh, yeah. or other things is is going to make for a really nice rounded salad. Yeah. She's kind of a salad. Again, this is a, another, another plant that um, uh, more of a curiosity and it seems to be everywhere here um, and I'll show you a few different pictures of it in, um, in its different stages. Uh, it seems to grow quite high. Uh, mm. That's that one and I'll, I'll go to the end one and you'll see, which I think is the same plant behind me there. Yeah. 
you know, and again, it's in that same woodland. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> this is um, straightforward, but I think you might have photographed, possibly photographed two species of the same family here. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you are in the um, the willow herb family. So I think what you've got in the, the final picture, I think is probably Rose Bay willow herb. And um, you may also have some lesser or greater willow herb. And the, the key differences there is uh, Rose Bay willow herb will be familiar to quite a lot of people has these big spires of um, purple flowers. Oh yeah, that looks like Rose Bay willow herb in behind you there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and that, that, that has these single, single, single spires with the leaves uh, as you're seeing and as, as you're showing us there. And then at the top, they have these purple inflorescences. Uh, this is a plant that's uh, known as fireweed in North America because it, it inhabits um, bomb sites and such like. Okay. Uh, and it's also called blitzweed uh, in, during, uh, during the war down in London, especially because it would it'd be the first color, it's a primary colonizer right. uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of, of disturbed ground, I suppose you would call it. Right. And it spreads by um, those little bit like dandelion clocks, you know, you'll see drifts of them coming across from areas of this. And that, that other picture with you in the foreground shows some of those spires when the flowers are pollinated. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the seed casings are bursting open now. And on a dry day, these will come out in drifts like a, like a dandelion clock and float around the air. And that's why you quite often see these in uh, railway embankments, um, <laughs> roadsides, because what happens is they're drifting through the air and they get carried along these little, uh, you know, kind of um, spores with a little kind of feathery parachutes and they carry along in the vortices of cars and alight. And uh, then once they alight, they spread by rhizomes through the ground. Okay. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's very quick spreading, very very common plant, and lots and lots of amazing food uses as well. Okay, Do you want me to some of the food uses. It was passing it by as possibly not an edible, but yeah, if, if there's something something. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll go through it from the spring. So so in the spring, rose bay willow herb starts off with um, little um, spires. They look like little mini palm trees, and this is about April kind of time in your bit of the world which is much the same as my bit of the world, just mm -hmm. across the water, really. Um, <clears throat> and um, they look like little open, um, palm trees. And if you pick them at that stage, then before they, they, the leaves are fully fully flopped open, uh, mm -hmm. just when, I don't know, maybe six inches to 10 inches tall, um, they are tender and juicy and you can eat them as a vegetable. Uh, but that's in early spring. Okay. Um, as they develop, they grow these kind of longer stems and uh, you can harvest the, uh, uh, you can split the stems and they have a pith inside them uh, that you can uh, scrape out and eat, and eat the pith of. Right. Um, and, uh, and then later on, when they fall, form, start to form their flowers, when you see the first flowers starting to appear, you can harvest the leaves. Now you can still do this. These ones look quite green and you've still got flowers on them. So you can harvest the leaves and some of the flowers. And uh, what you do is you can rub them in your hand and bruise them. And then this is rather counterintuitive. You put them in a plastic bag and let them sweat away in a plastic or a polythene bag for okay. about three or four days. And then they start to lightly ferment. Uh, you, you take them out of the bag after a few days and they'll look, they won't look very nice, but they'll be starting to develop this kind of, kind of funky tea kind of flavor. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you dry them out. So dry them out in a warm, you know, very low oven or a dehydrator if you have one or, and uh, they dry out into a really nice tea. Okay. Uh, this tea has been, um, has been widely used in the past, um, and uh, it's known as Ivan's chai because uh, it was drunk a lot in Russia. And uh, it's kind of gone out of fashion in the UK, but it's coming back in again now. People are taking more interest in foraging, and it's got lots of um, health benefits. Got antioxidants in it. It's uh, useful in the support of male prostate function. All sorts of good things like that with uh, from the tea. And it's actually as a as a forest tea goes, it's a really tasty tea. It drinks a little bit like a like a black tea if you ferment it for longer or a green tea if you if you drink it when it, you know without much fermentation uh, but it's a really easy process you can read all about that again i've got a whole page on this on my website so if you go over to gallery wild foods and click on uh, and put use the search box and put in uh, rose bay willow herb uh, then you'll see lots of uses and some recipes right. uh, the recipe you can make is uh, you, i know people use the flowers to make a syrup uh, you need quite a lot of the flowers but um they are abundant and, uh, and you can uh, infuse them into a syrup. It's not, oh. I don't think it's particularly tasty syrup, but it is pink and quite pretty. So uh, a lot of people like that. That's good. I was passing off as just a uh, curiosity. So <laughs> a lot of information uh, there. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you were mentioning, I mean, this is just clover really and, and stuff. You know, some of these stronger, 
I suppose, would you call them stronger flavored or maybe not as palatable type um, uh, plants like um, dandelion leaf, there's a bit of plantain there and a bit of clover. Would you yeah. use them for anything in particular or do you just mix them in or do you, what, what, what would your sort of go to? Yeah. That's um, yeah, a good timing because I kind of alluded to this already and these are, you're talking about some of the possibly the stronger tasting plants, things like um, plantain leaves, ribwort plantain, broadleaf plantain. Uh, that have um, lot, kind of good flavour, but a little bit of bitterness and, uh, you know, kind of, you know, we've, we've become accustomed to not having much bitterness in our diet, but, you know, in, in the right quantities, it uh, can be extremely good for you, the, those sorts of plants. And certainly, um, so things like chickweed um, make those plants, that's the thing to kind of mix through the salad. You wouldn't eat a plateful of, uh, of um, ribwort plantain, but you would mix it through a, another salad, maybe in the spring with wild garlic and with some of your um, saxifrage, but also chickweed and these milder tasting plants. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's that's what, that's how I think about uh, using those plants. And they're not, not something you're just gonna eat only those, it's about that biodiverse eating and mixing it in with other things. Yeah, uh, what you've got there though is red clover and the flowers of red clover, they're in the legume family. So the flowers of red clover are good, make an excellent tea if you, if you dry them or you can make them into a tea fresh as they are. Okay. Um, so actually in the pea family of plants, uh, you can eat red clover leaf, but don't don't overdo it. There, uh, you've got to be a little bit more careful with the legume family, and not just gorging on them. But you would have to work hard to, to eat too much uh, red clover, I would thought. Um, but yeah, certainly the flowers make a really good tea, and I think it's got lots of uh, uses by herbalists uh, in treatment of things that don't come to my mind uh, off the top of my head. But, uh, oh. Certainly, red clover tea is uh, is definitely a good thing. Okay, that's good to know. So the, the, the next one is again, just curiosity. Um, it's just more of a flower that uh, is close to uh, a lake uh, that I come across quite often. Um, and I just have it next to a USB cable just to get the size of it really. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you're getting good at these now. <laughs> um, right, okay. Um, that might be. Um, I, I, have, I, haven't come, I haven't come across it any place else really just at this particular lake. Uh, yeah, and I, think, I think what you've got here, uh, do you have any of the foliage there? Uh, do I? Uh, actually, there are no leaves on the stem there, actually. Uh, no, I don't, actually. Uh, OK, I think what you have there is uh, Scabious, uh, S-C-A-B-I-O-U-S. Um, I'm just getting this up on my phone because um, I need to remind myself of what the uh, what the flowers look like there there are different varieties of um of scabious um and uh, the one we get is uh, most commonly around here is um um they get field scabious and oh it's not it's not coming to mind at the moment but um very pretty little purplish flowers like this but mm. that's all right uh, again it's the the lake would be kind of a boggy area lots of yeah cocktails and so but again it was just curiosity more than nothing else uh, I, th I think I, I can't be certain from these pictures because I would need to see some foliage as well. But I think it's worth you checking out um, in your botanical guidebooks, maybe, and comparing it to different types of scabious, um, S A C B I O U S. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the one, the word I was looking for. The, the really common one is um, Devil's Bit scabious, okay. uh, but then you get you get more aquatic versions, and that's maybe what you've got here. Let me just. Um, yeah, yeah, this is this is this is the right sort of flower. Yeah, yeah, as I thought. Um, so, but I, I suspect because you're saying it's growing in really, really wet ground, yeah. Devil's Bit Scabious, to my recollection, grows to generally in sandy macker soil, what we would call in the west coast of Scotland macker, low lying sandy areas. But if this is on wet ground, it could be there's pro quite probably something called marsh scabious or something like that. You yeah. certainly get field scabious. But uh, yeah, ch check it out. Um, the Latin name for that would be. Uh, Succisa pretensis, that's devil's bit scabious, S-U-C-C-I-S-A. I'm not aware of any particular uses for that one, not to say there aren't any, um, mm. but, uh, I'm not aware of them. Yeah. Okay, the only mushroom I have uh, come, uh, or the only mushroom on this list really, uh, and again, just a curiosity because I've never seen it before here. Oh, how rude. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. What a great find. Well, yes. 
So, so this is uh, one of our very distinctive uh, mushrooms, and um, what you've got here is uh, Phallus impudicus, or the uh, the stinkhorn mushroom. Fair this enough. is a fairly fairly common mushroom of the uh, uh, that, that you'll find, um, and it, you'll find it in the woods, but also in grassland and gardens and places like that. And uh, unlike a lot of other mushrooms, its um, its reproductive strategy for spreading its spores is not just to drop them like a very fine powder catching mm. wind runs like a lot of other mushrooms do but it's uh, it's spores are born on this um on this head uh, that you're seeing here the dark bit the dark bit yeah uh, and uh, and uh, what it does and i'm sure you notice this when you're photographing this it uh, it stinks absolutely yeah yes <laughs> what was it smelling of i wasn't too sure if it was coming from them yeah i can't really recall what was, it was definitely um noticeable anyway yeah, so so the smell is generally of like basically somewhere between rotting flesh and feces, okay. uh, probably more like rotting flesh. Um, and uh, quite often you'll smell these before you see them, and they can actually be quite hard to find uh, if you smell them in the woods and there's a lot of ground cover. Uh, you can smell them from you know fifteen, maybe even a hundred meters away if the, if the conditions are right. Um, but can you find them? And um, yeah, and that's so they attract flies with that foul-smelling uh, gleba on top. And then the flies land on that and catch the spores in their in their feet and then carry that away to new fertile places. And I think you see quite a lot of these by paths, especially where there's a lot of dog walking, because what happens is the flies then go on to some dog muck or something yeah. and, uh, and, and leave the spores there, which is perfect for the mushroom because it's in a really fertile space uh, to, uh, to, to, to start its uh, next stage of growth. So uh, these, are, these are amazing mushrooms. They always grow, grow, gain a bit of a snigger when we encounter them on my guided walks. Um, yeah, really amazing. Very quick growing. So that bit that you're seeing, the white bit, that, that grows. And if you look at it, it's almost like a honeycomb effect. And that can expand almost um, in front of your eyes in the right conditions, certainly growing at like a centimeter an hour or something like that. Very quick growing it, when it all the conditions are right. For the day after, I mean, it seems like literally only there and days or three days and they're on guard. Yeah, very, very quick growing and uh, quick to attract flies and then quick to sort of fall over if it's uh, if it's yeah. raining as well yeah they uh, soon go flaccid if you don't like that. and then um, uh, the really interesting part of these guys is they they have a stage uh, if you looked at the base of that one you would have seen it's emerged from this uh, little ball um and the ball is actually uh, the, the, uh, uh, before that emerges from its basically its sack um, that the sack is known as a witch's egg. And if you find them, they're really heavy. They look a little bit like they have been mistaken for puffballs. Okay. But when you cut them open, they've got this gel filled covering on the outside, inside, just inside the skin. And then inside you'll see the, the head developing, but there's no, and then that expands from below and pushes it out of that egg. But okay. at the egg stage, you can actually eat these. Um, you would take off the kind of covering and the slimy layer and you actually slice the bit and it hasn't developed that revolting smell at that stage. Uh, so you can actually eat them. They taste a little bit of uh, radish, slightly radishy kind of flavor at that stage and a, and a kind of crisp texture. But you certainly, uh, it's not very appealing once they emerge because they develop that foul smell. Yeah, a bit of hard work possibly. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pass. I, mean, I, I have harvested the, the witch's egg stages and put them in my fridge. And then right. uh, the next day, thank goodness it wasn't my, my mum visiting, and uh, you open the fridge and they actually will emerge in your fridge. It's a fun thing to do with kids, actually. Uh, they will actually still continue to grow once you pick the witch's egg stage. Okay. And uh, they, they actually burst out in my, in my fridge. It's, uh, yeah, quite, quite rude. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's see what else. Um, actually, yeah, I, I suppose, again, um, Harry Bittercrest, I just went looking for it there. I'm sure it seems to be all around the house, really, in pavements and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, loads of this around. And uh, you'll find this in sort of similar kind of areas as you'll find chickweed. It's opportunistic and um, it will come up in cracks in the pavement. It will come up in window boxes because the seeds lie dormant for a long time in the, in the, in the soil. And anywhere where you disturb the ground, you'll soon have a crop of uh, Harry Bittercrest. I think this is one of our truly delicious edible weeds. So they come a salad of that with chickweed and a few um, clover flowers and a bit of plantain mixed through and you start to be, develop this really lovely, tasty, rounded flower, a uh, rounded salad. You could have a bit of sliced uh, stinkhorn egg in there as well, just to, just for radishy flavor. <laughs> um, tell me this again, is it, is it like chickweed? Will it flower 
at different stages all year round? Will it the uh, Yeah, this this is definitely a little opportunistic. You would call it an annual, I think is be the technical term for it, but uh, it's more than annual. It, I mean, I notice places where it goes through several cycles in a year. Um, so, you know, you can find this right through the winter in little rosettes and then it'll, you know, areas where it'll grow more bushy in the summer. But any ground that gets disturbed, even whether it's by cattle or human in intervention or by a path or something like that, it'll just start its growth cycle as soon as there's an opportunity. So you can normally find some of this fresh all year round. Really high in vitamin C, lovely peppery taste. It's like a kind of a, a light um, a rocket kind of flavour, like a, or a mild watercress. It's really, really tasty. Again, this is the first time I've, I've went hunting and I, I found it, but I've only found it in one spot, would be the word sorrel. Beautiful, yeah. Um, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. This is, this is a really quite common woodland plant that will grow under both um, coniferous plantations and under um, deciduous, kind of more natural kind of woodland or uh, um, certainly under deciduous woodland. And uh, yeah, like a ground cover plant, very frail, fragile, small, little. And the, and the key with these is people say they can look a little bit like clover, but the key thing to notice when you zoom in on them is they, have, they always have three heart-shaped leaves, okay? Mm. And that's really consistent. Um, whereas if you look at clover more closely, you had the red clover earlier on, clover would have the oval leaves. Um, you know all about clover in, in Ireland, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is, a, there is a theory, actually, that, um, interestingly, I'm talking to a Podrick, um, that St. Podrick, um, he, I think the, the idea of the shamrock kind of came from him in illustrating the, um, the Holy Trinity. There, there is a theory that he, it was thought that he would probably live in a kind of more wooded kind of environment. And there is a theory that the, the, the shamrock was actually wood sorrel uh, that he used to illustrate the Holy Trinity. Um, and that would kind of make a lot of sense if he, you know, like you imagine there was a lot more wood cover uh, yeah. when he was um, out doing his uh, preaching and so on and uh, prophesizing. And um, so, yeah, this could very well be the original uh, shamrock. Yeah. And, and the, the habitat of this, again, I found it in um, a, a mature woodland area. But I mean, can you find it in general hedgerows or where would um, you go for it mostly? Yeah, or might find it in shady hedgerows where there's not too much competition, but um, really it, it does best under mature woodland canopies where there's lots of shade. So other medium-sized plants, that kind of understory, don't really develop. Uh, so, so basically, this is the the main thing between the the woodland floor and the and the actual canopy of the trees. So usually in in kind of established kind of woodland like that. But I mean, I've found masses like carpets of this for miles under under Sitka spruce plantation forestry uh, okay. it's not 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 uncommon at all but also in ancient oak woodland that we have uh, down in Galloway here or across in Galloway I should say for you um, and uh, you know it's, it's pretty common in both but the, the biggest concentrations I actually find are under um, plantation forestry when the conditions are just right just enough light but not too much light that it has to compete too much with other other species again I suppose the fact that I, I I've only started looking for it. I probably didn't notice it before, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing with foraging. You know, once you notice a little bit of something, then you like you start to see the world in a different way, and you notice more of it, and you'll notice other things. And before you know it, you're you're much more deeply connected into your into your landscape. Uh, by the way, wood sorrel again. You 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 show me lots of ingredients for an amazing salad here. I think this would be really good. This would add a lemony twist to your salad with your chickpeas, maybe your bulk item, and then and you've got some wood sorrel in there and all those other little bits and bobs we've been talking about for those it pungent flavours, really nice. Has that kind of bitterness of common sorrel as well? Or yeah, I mean, I would say that um, it shares a lot of the flavours of common sorrel. I wouldn't say common sorrel was particularly bitter, it's sour, uh, but it's a predominant flavour. And um, you'll find the same with wood sorrel. They're not actually um, closely related um, in botanical terms, but they share the name sorrel just because they are so sour. Uh, sorrel actually um, comes from, um, in Scotland, uh, well, we call it su surex, and that comes from sour dock, essentially. So common sorrel with the oval leaves and the V-shape at, at, the, at the back, um, that, that's in the dock family, whereas um, uh, wood sorrel is in the oxalis family of mm -hmm. plants. But they share, uh, they share um, um, oxalic acid, which is the same acid as you would get in rhubarb. Um, and uh, so they uh, add that nice acidity. But I would say with wood sorrel, that flavour is more like um, Granny Smith apples or apple skin, whereas with sorrel, it's got a bit more kind of full on and pungent and uh, 
maybe maybe more towards citrus, although not citrusy. And um, yeah, and uh, obviously it's going to be hard to eat too much wood sorrel, but you should be aware that oxalic acid uh, can um, displace calcium from the blood and lead to uh, kidney stones and other problems if you eat too much of it. Now, too much wood sorrel would be a lot of wood sorrel. Um, you know, it's such a tiny little plant with such a strong flavor. I don't think, unless you have a severe um, kidney uh, problem, uh, you're going to really struggle to eat too much wood sorrel, I, I would have thought. You need, to, you need to go at it quite hard. But just to be aware of that, so maybe if your doctor said to you, um, you shouldn't be eating too much spinach or rhubarb, because they're also really high in oxalic acid, um, then you should definitely, uh, you know, just be more thoughtful if you're eating sorrel or even wood sorrel. But as I say, the flavor, the flavor is so strong. I think that's a, a warning that we have to repeat, but it's definitely not something that should really put anybody off tasting it because the chances of you eating even a handful of wood sorrel in, in one day is, is really slim and you'd need to eat a, a couple of hundred grams on a regular basis for it to be any kind of issue. So, I mean, one last one, and it's, this is more of a video and I just food very quick. I, it's, it's basically Bordock anyway, but it was just on, on the path. Uh, so um, as I go across from the Bordock over to the other side of the laneway there, yes. I got other leaf. I don't know what it is. I'm just assuming it's fox. What would you think that leaf is there? Yeah, okay. Um, this looks quite likely to be foxglove, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the key features of foxglove, and, and this is a really good practice for anybody planning to forage, you should be able to recognize um, foxgloves at all stages of growth. Uh, because, you know, two, three leaves of this and you could be dead. It's, uh, it, it interrupts your cardiac function um, and gives you, um, you know, like changes your heart rhythms, essentially. So you do need to be extra, extra careful and able to recognize this when you're out picking wild garlic in the spring or anything. Um, so the key features that I look for um, when it's, you know, when there's no flower showing are these, um, you know, oval kind of pointed with a, with a point serrated at the edges and heavily, heavily veined and quite hairy leaves. Now, okay. when I say hairy, I don't mean big long hairs, but I mean almost like a velvety kind of hair. Correct. And uh, if you look down into the, the, the middle of this rosette, and they always grow in rosettes like this, and you, this is how you're gonna see them through the winter. Um, they're a biennial plant, so it means they have a two year growth cycle. Yeah, this is a really good uh, coverage of the underside of the leaves, which is super kind of, uh, you know, velvety and veined, I suppose is the, is the main thing that comes out of it. That's rather beautiful, isn't it? When you look at it closely like that. Look at the uh, look at this sort of serrated or even almost scalloped edge. Yeah. Um, and then if you look down into the rosette of the of the whole thing and down at the stem, that's when you start to see the real velvetiness starting to appear. And uh, quite often, if you get into the middle of that rosette that you're showing us there, uh, you'll actually start to see. Yeah, you can see like the sheen and of the velvet here, and mm. almost maybe just near your fingers a hint. They normally start to look a little bit purple uh, when you get down into them like this. So. Um, yeah, one, really. One, oh, I know. It just happened. Just it was on the same area as yeah. Lee, so I just thought I'd bring the two of them together, just so that. So yeah, no, absolutely, and a really, really good one to flag up and be aware of. And and if you're <clears throat> if you're out looking at burdock, I mean, burdock leaves are superficially similar to this. Although burdock leaves, the where they clasp onto the stem, uh, they they will come round in a in a in a in a kind of a in a V shape almost, or a rounded V shape, if you like. Whereas um, foxglove leaves taper. Uh, see if you notice the tapering down in, onto the uh, from the leaf onto the stem. Yeah, yeah. Work, yeah. So you'll see them these rosettes right through the winter, and winter's a really good time to go out and get used to observing them. You know, like most people can um, observe a foxglove when it's in flower with those beautiful little bell shape, little fairy yeah. bells hanging down the purple flowers, and I think most people would probably know that that's you know quite strongly toxic but um i think it's really important as foragers to be able to recognize them at this stage so that's a really good thing to to share sure. come here that was the last one mark so well done <laughs> no, great well uh, i'm glad i actually knew most of the things you had photos of which isn't always the case but it's uh, <laughs> nice to explore your landscape with you i hope it's uh, useful and if you if you share this film then um yeah i hope people find it interesting and uh we'll useful. Do. We'll, we'll We'll be back again. Does this foraging uh, tend to die down a bit towards the winter or, or is there still lots of activity in, in it? Or 
Yeah, I mean, I suppose autumn is the high, high busy times for foragers, and we're right in the thick of that just now. So the things I'm harvesting now, I'm, I'm very into wild mushrooms. There's a lot of wild mushrooms out there now, um, so, uh, but also the fruits and stuff like that. And we're just getting to that stage where I'm out picking sloes, blackthorn fruit. Yeah. Um, they're kind of a late autumn kind of harvest for me. So, you know, I pick them around mid-October to November sort of time. Um, by November, things do start to kind of, you know, definitely pass their best. But I still pick uh, wild mushrooms in the forest right through to December, quite quite a lot of years. They can get a little bit soggy depending on the weather. So, so you know, autumn, I was thinking in the west of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland and, and Ireland in general, in fact, most of the UK, we're in this maritime climate. We don't really, unless you're in the south of England, we don't have much of a proper summer. We yeah. basically have spring and then, it, and then a, maybe a tiny fragment of summer and then autumn. And then autumn lasts through until almost until spring, and you might get a couple of weeks of what most people would call a proper winter, you know, where it's really cold and freezing. So, so I actually just think of spring as like spring and autumn in general. And, uh, you know, and so you can get a lot of those autumnal things right through. And uh, especially if you're near the sea, Northern Ireland, quite sheltered, or you're just on the border there, aren't you? So, uh, yeah, it's yeah. always plenty to go at. But um, if we do this again, maybe we could start to talk about um, the things that you start to encounter in winter. and. For me, it's actually as a, somebody, if you forage a lot, winter's almost like a pause and it's like a rest, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if it was like, if it, if it was just as much to pick as there was in September and October, you'd be exhausted come January, you know? So mm -hmm. it's actually like a time to take a breath and pause, but there's certainly things I go looking for specifically in winter. So certain roots I use for flavorings, um, some certain types of tree foliage and things like that that are really useful. And there's a few winter fungi out there as well that are really good. And if people want to know what's going on, then if they go onto Galloway Wild Foods um, website, and then you can actually find there's like some menu items up in the on the menu, and you can scroll through them and have spring, summer, autumn, winter, and all my blogs and information posts are organised according to season there. So you can find the stuff that's kind of in season for uh, how, how how things are going with you. Excellent. So thanks again, Mark. As Thanks, Roderick. Yeah, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Happy foraging, and uh, I hope we'll it's a useful resource for the community. Take care. Hopefully, somebody will give you a bell. Cheerio. Cheers now. Bye. Bye.